All right, I think we're gonna get started here. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to Product Austin. Uh, really appreciate you all coming tonight. Uh, show of hands, who here is uh, first time in Product Austin? All right, well, I got good news for you and bad news. The good news is we have a phenomenal speaker tonight. The bad news is you've missed a lot of really good speakers. In fact, I'm gonna read some of them just so you guys can hear how much you've missed. Um, we had Jared Spool, he was here at the last session talking about UX. Brian Belfer of HubSpot. Near, Near Yale, author of Hooked, John Cloco, author of Well Designed, um, and the list goes on. So highly encourage you to go to productaustin.com, sign up for the, the meetup, and uh, keep abreast of the upcoming sessions, because we have some other really good ones coming later in the year. So for tonight's session, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, Kenneth Berger here. He's going to give a speech, and then we're going to spend about 20, 30 minutes afterwards kind of doing some Q&A. So really appreciate all you coming. And uh, before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsors. So big thanks to Capital Factory uh, for hosting the event tonight. Always uh, appreciate their space and their invitation. And uh, if you haven't met Prabhakar, Prabhakar, raise your hand. He's um, one of the co-founders of the group here. And Prabhakar has um, the next to impossible tax of hunting down um, great speakers like Kenneth and like some of the other ones I just mentioned and getting them to come to Austin. A lot of these people, they don't live here. Um, they're elsewhere in the world. They're elsewhere in the United States. And convincing them to come here and speak up at Project Austin. So big thanks to Prabhakar for uh, helping us hunt them down. And, uh, Prabhakar uh, works craftsmanpm.com. So please check out craftsmanpm and uh, follow Product Austin. In fact, I think we have a Twitter feed going there if you want to uh, uh, shoot out links and stuff like that, they'll appear on the big board. So, um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Kenneth uh, Berger. He was the first PM at Slack, um, before that, founder of Yescraft, SaaS products at Adobe, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about strategies for growth tonight. So, all right, Kenneth, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. Is that tuning okay? Everything sound good? Fantastic. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the uh, the best way to rotate here so that you know I can see look everyone in the eye at least once. Um, but um, yeah, I really appreciate you folks having me. I love coming out to Austin. I was just you know talking about I think the last time I was here was 2011. So it's uh, it's, it's an amazing community that you folks have here. It's really exciting to see so many people who are founding companies or working in startups and you know being being a person myself who you know worked at a big company and then has worked at a couple of startups now. Um, I can say it's a very good decision. It's an exciting place to be. So basically, I, what I wanted to do tonight was just talk about a few of the things that I learned um, as the first product manager in Slack. Because it's one of those things where, you know, when you're growing that fast, there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of things I learned in a short period of time. There's a lot of things we all learned. So hopefully, I'm trying to pick out some of some of the things that I think were just a little bit surprising or counterintuitive, and hopefully will be useful for whatever projects you're working on at uh, your own companies. So let's dive into it. Uh, so you probably all know, since you've come here, that Slack's been on this incredible run for the past year. All this growth, all these new customers, all these partnerships and integrations. Um, and of course, you know, now that I've left, everyone asks me, how did, how did you do it? What's the secret sauce? You know, how, do I, how do I make this happen for my own company? And you know, of course, the answer is never as simple as, as folks want it to be, right? It's, there's no, there's no one secret sauce. There's 10, 20, 30, 40 different little things that we do, and I think a lot of companies do, um, that collectively really make a difference in terms of growth and sort of having that sort of passion that customers do have for Slack. Um, so a little about me first. Um, so I was the first product manager hired at Slack. I reported to Stuart, the CEO. Uh, before that, I founded a startup called YesGraph that was also a SaaS <laughs> Um, a business startup. Uh, I was also backed by Andreessen and Excel, just like Slack. Um, and before that, I worked at Adobe for eight years, so I was a big company guy for a while. Uh, I was a product manager there, uh, and I worked on M&A, I worked on the Onitor acquisition, on the Typekit acquisition, so that was really interesting experience. But really, I, I think the thing that you'll probably notice, you know, as I talk about some of the things I learned, is that my orientation is very much from the world of design and in the world of user research, right, because I, it's um, it's, it's something that, that I think is really increasingly important, especially in business startups. People have been talking about the consumerization of IT for a long time, at least in certain you know, venture capital circles. And I think what's exciting with Slack is that these things are starting to become a reality. You're getting these enterprise apps, these business apps that are actually fun to use, that people care about, that people are passionate about. And that's, that's what I kind of hope to talk a little bit about today. 
So the first strategy for growth I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, it's not anything about you know metrics or you know growth hacking or anything like that. It's about big stories um, and the big ideas behind them. And really, this is inspired by the way that Slack used PR, because I think that a lot of people look at all of the PR coverage that Slack got, and they think, oh well, it's because you know Slack is this unicorn company and or it has this famous CEO, and certainly those things help. But it was also because we put a lot of really explicit emphasis on PR from the very beginning, even when we were a tiny company of 20 people. And really what's powerful about that is that we were starting to look into sort of the, the future of where we wanted to go, right? We weren't just talking about where we were at that moment because we were an early stage startup, I'm sure like a lot of you folks, and not everything was there. So what do I mean by big ideas? There's, uh, there's this quote from Peter Thiel that I really like, which is, what important truth do very few people agree with you on? And really what, what this gets at is unconventional truths, right? What are, what are something that you believe, you know, maybe you, you and your co-founders or the employees of your company that most other people don't believe, that are sort of unconventional and striking and sort of go against the grain of, of what most people think? And these ideas are really powerful. And I think a lot of people don't understand how much that these ideas aren't just something that can be for you and your co-founders. It can be something that's powerful in telling your story outside the company and getting customers and partners and all these other people excited about what you're doing and where you're going. So if all these companies are getting founded with big ideas behind them, where do they all go, right? Because we're, we're, not, we're not seeing all these huge ideas in the press all the time necessarily. Um, some of them don't work out, obviously. Uh, a lot of companies dissolve over the years. Um, some of them are forgotten, right? You've got quarterly goals. You've got, uh, you've got you know, trying to make numbers for you know a certain customer or you know any of the thousand things that you need to do in the course of running a business. And it's easy to lose sight of these things, right? Because you do have to do all that other operational stuff. But it's a mistake to forget about them entirely because the best of these big ideas. They don't fade away, right? Even if they have, you know, the, the other operational things that the company needs to work on to actually get things done, the companies still remember those big ideas. And over time, those big ideas become the new normal. They, they can transition from being this thing that sounds so far out there that you know a few years ago you know never would have believed to be true to all of a sudden be common knowledge. And you know, with some of these really disruptive companies, you see that happen. That you know, having Uber be this you know, $50 billion worldwide force is no longer so crazy, right? It sounds pretty, pretty reasonable these days. So the question becomes, what should we do about it? And I think that the simplest thing is just to invest in PR help early. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I started YesGraph, that it was, it was hard for us to do that because you know we were just two people sitting in a room trying to figure out a product that was going to be meaningful for people, and it seemed too early to talk about PR. The product wasn't ready. We were still figuring out exactly what direction we wanted to go, and I understand that fear, and I think it's natural to have that. But in retrospect, I wish we'd attacked it much earlier and gotten PR help much, much earlier in the development of YesGraph. And that's just because what PR professionals can bring to the table is really powerful, right? It's not just sort of helping you get your story figured out or you know, uh, get, getting you prepped for you know, a PR briefing. It's having those real connections with journalists, right? So being able to have a level of trust with the audience that you actually care about for growing your product that's far beyond what you might be connected to through, through your network or through the tech press or that sort of thing. Um, and they can also give you feedback on your story, right? Because what your story is going to be is not necessarily just, hey, here's my product, you know, this is what it does, or we raised a round of funding, or it's often kind of more nuanced than that, and maybe not so obvious. And so having someone to bounce those ideas off of that can tell you this is going to be an interesting story, people are going to respond to this, journalists are going to respond to it, their audience is going to respond to it, can be really powerful, even from the very beginning, which I think a lot of people don't know. Kind of the corollary to this is you got to go beyond the cliches. You know, I, again, I made the mistake of thinking, all right, our, you know, we raised around funding from these famous investors, so of course our first story should be that we raised around funding. But that's kind of a boring story, right? 
And you know, we got a little bit of pickup from that. You know, we were in TechCrunch, but did that have a long, a long lasting effect on the business? Not really. And I think if you look at what Slack did in the early days talking about PR, it wasn't about sort of who they raised from or what the big customer was or you know, a certain uh, sort of growth metric milestone. It was these more interesting stories, these stories that actually were kind of more human and resonated with people and spoke to sort of what the company was doing at a higher level. And I'll talk about some examples of those. And you know, I've, I've put up you know, quite a few here, um, and I think it's, it's useful just to illustrate the breadth. And this is only a subset, right? I mean, there's lots of different stories that we've told only from the past couple of years at Slack. And so the, the, the top couple here, um, or the top row, is really focused around the product. So in the early days, we talked about Slack as this email killer. And of course, this was, this was a great story for the initial time, when no one had heard of Slack, um, and we wanted to get it on the lips of people. And of course, everyone has heard of email. And people tend to have a love-hate relationship with email. Um, and so that got us on a lot of people's radar, but it wasn't necessarily nuanced enough for you know, an ongoing story of what the company was really about, right? Slack, email doesn't have to die for Slack to be successful. So instead, over time, we transitioned to Slack being this kind of catalyst of organizational transformation. It was more about making companies be more transparent, helping people communicate in more real time, really making teams and companies just work better. And you know, over time, that went from being something that was a little bit far out, okay, guys, this is chat software, um, to being something that actually was pretty plausible. We were getting great feedback on that from a lot of our major customers. And that kind of transitions to the latest message there, which is Slack is the next Microsoft, which sounds crazy, right? It's, it's, a, it's an aggressive message. But this idea that Slack wants to be the Microsoft that you want to use, that's centered around what people actually care about, sort of driving passion in its users, um, is a really passionate message. And it's something that's um, you know, aggressive in a good way, right? That it points to where the company is going in the future and what it wants to do, and not just what it is today. None of these are about chat software, right? None of these are about messaging. They're about the bigger mission behind the company. Now, even more interesting, you know, these, these messages on the second line, they're not about product at all. Like, they're really the, the sort of stories around the rest of the company, sort of the what's behind the scenes and the different beliefs behind sort of how Slack got where it is today. I think this is even more counterintuitive, especially for early stage companies to say, well, you know, I'm a founder, I want it to be about the product and about you know, maybe me and my co-founder and really keeping on the straight and narrow. But honestly, I mean, the benefit of PR is just telling stories that get people to connect with your company. And so you don't have to just tell the straight and narrow story. Whatever interesting story you have to tell, tell it. So with Slack, you know, we had this great story about you know, underdogs making games, right? That Slack was originally born out of a game that you know, didn't do well. The core team's previous product, Flickr, was born out of a game. So this idea that these gaming developers keep making successful productivity software, it's counterintuitive, it's interesting, it's a great story, and it got published. It's not about the messaging software, but it did the job anyway. You know, the second one here is, is funny because, you know, it's, it's, the, the story was massive growth, no marketing required, but Obviously, I'm talking about PR being great marketing. It worked very well from the beginning of Slack. <laughs> but people think of advertising as marketing, so the discussion was around no marketing required. And you know, this goes again to kind of those unconventional truths I mentioned, right? That most companies think, all right, the first thing I'm going to do is buy some Google ads and start to see what traction I can get from that. And you know, Slack experimented with that, but um, that wasn't the focus of marketing from the very beginning. We were getting feedback in different ways, and we were getting growth in different ways. Um, so that was an interesting story to tell. And then finally, this, this latest story I think is really interesting, which is you know, the diversity being such a core value at Slack. And you know, this is really true. I mean, Slack was by far the most diverse workplace I worked at in the tech world. That's by gender, by race, by educational background, and that stuff matters, right? I mean, it's, it's in the conversation a lot right now in the tech industry. Um, people really care about it, and being able to come out and have an opinion on that and be part of that conversation, I think mattered to a lot of people. And especially at this point that Slack is at now, 
where they're trying to hire a lot of folks, they want to have the broadest audience, the broadest set of people uh, to hire from that they can. So I think this is a message that's, again, not about the product, but really puts Slack in a lot of conversations that are interesting. And this is something that any company can do, right? We all have big ideas that you kind of believe in. The question is packaging it into a story that's meaningful to the press or whoever you want to communicate. So, high level takeaway for this one, you've got big ideas, go tell the big story behind them. Next up, peaks and valleys. So, this, this idea I think is a really important one that's kind of under underreported in, in the success of Slack. And what I mean by peaks and valleys is it's really inspired by all this feedback that Slack got from the, from the very beginning of, oh, the software is so well designed, it's so great. I came in, you know, I've been a product manager for a long time. I said, well, there's some good things, there are some not so good things. Uh, I, I really saw it as a product that wasn't uniformly good because few products, you know, are, are perfect in every single area. It's more a product with high peaks and low values, right? Especially at the early stages. Not everything was there that we wanted to be there in Slack. There were whole big areas of features that weren't there at all. But there were also these peaks. There were these moments of joy. There were these moments where we went above and beyond. And it didn't have to be big, but people remembered it. It was meaningful. And that's powerful in terms of building a product that people are really passionate about, that doesn't just do the job, but that people remember and care about. And so, I think this sort of begs the question, it was something that you know, I thought about a lot in the early days of Slack, was are you building a flat product? And what I mean by that is, what are people gonna remember? You know, if you look out at a landscape like this, it's pretty enough, it does the job. I could go on vacation there, I did go on vacation there. <laughs> I don't exactly remember where it was, or what year, or was that on a train or a car? You know, without having these peaks, these things that you can remember, that you can latch onto, it's hard to get passionate about what a product does and to sort of go through the pain that you inevitably have to go through in order to adopt something new, go through the pain of switching, all that sort of thing. So this idea of the minimum viable product, it's alluring, but minimum viable sometimes just isn't enough, right? And I think when you're thinking about what your minimum viable products are, you have to think about what does a product look like where I'm only doing the minimum every single area of the product. And I think you'll find that you don't want to do the minimum everywhere, right? You want to be doing nothing or an absolute minimum in some places and really go above and beyond in others. So this, this quote from Paul Bukai really kind of speaks to this idea. And I, I love this quote it's from a great article. You should check it out called, if your product is great, it doesn't need to be good. Good name. I wish I was that good at naming articles. Um, but uh, the quote is, pick three key attributes or features, get those things very, very right, and then forget about everything else. And so you know, Paul was talking about um, kind of the high level here, right, that focus on three big benefits that your, your software can provide. And that's still good advice. I definitely agree with that. But that can feel expensive, and especially in those early days. Can my product really be good at three things at once when we're only two people sitting in a room trying to build something? Um, it's, it can take a lot of time to get have three big benefits that you really believe you're better than the competition in. And so I think what I learned at Slack was that those peaks, they don't have to be big. These peaks can be tiny. They just have to be memorable. And so part of what we did in the course of the development of Slack was look for those opportunities to not just say, okay, these are the three high-level benefits of the software, let's deliver on these in an extreme way, but say, what are, what are some little ways we can be better in a noticeable way, a way that's meaningful, that people will latch on to, that, that, you know, that really matters in the grand scheme, but doesn't necessarily cost a lot of engineering time. So I'm gonna talk about a few examples of this in Slack. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, I, I don't know. Actually, how many people, show of hands, how many people are actually using Slack? Are you familiar with? Okay, so we've got a pretty good mix. But uh, for those of you who aren't aware, so at channel is this feature where if you 
if you enter a channel into a channel in Slack, everyone in that channel is notified. And so this can kind of be a tense operation, right? If you've got hundreds of people in that channel and they're in multiple time zones, they could be waking them up and sending buzzes to their phone. So you know, in the early days, we got a fair amount of complaints about this, of people saying people were abusing that channel, people using that channel accidentally or not understanding the impact of what it did. So we thought, well, let's have a confirmation dialogue, right? Make sure that people want to do it. You've probably seen confirmation dialogues in you know, a thousand different places. And I think it would have been really, really easy to do a default confirmation dialogue that looks like every other that you've ever seen. But the standard dialogues are for edge cases. And this isn't an edge case. That channel is, is one of the kind of central features of Slack. And so we didn't treat it like an edge case, right? We, we designed it from scratch. And so we said the number of people that you're going to affect. We said the number of time zones to give you a sense of impact. Uh, we've got keyboard shortcuts to account for the power users. We've got links to team settings for the admins. So to me, that's just good design, right? We, we prioritize it and put some details in, into this dialogue. To me, what makes it a peak is the rooster. Because the rooster was not in the spec. Right? I did not spec cute rooster <laughs> on the right edge of dialogue, make everyone feel better with cartoon character. It was something that just came up in, in the design as I was working with the, the designer. And I think what we realized was that we had a tense situation that we were trying to diffuse. And we could do that to some degree with design, but it could only go so far. It was always going to be a little bit scary to send an at channel message into a general channel with hundreds of people in it who might be disrupted. And so having this character there who says, look, it's all going to be all right. You know, we all, we all need to crow every once in a while. Don't worry about it. Uh, I, think, I think that was, that was, that was something that when we saw that rooster, we all immediately said, this is going in the product. This is not one of those design details that gets thrown out you know, when, when you're iterating. And I was really gratified that no one said a word and the rooster went into the product. Because we've gotten so many positive comments on it. When I think about the fact that we started with a standard confirmation dialogue, are you sure you want to do that? And now we've got endless comments on Twitter and how genius the rooster is. You know, I, I don't want to toot our own horn, but this is the kind of thing that is not hard. It was not expensive to sort of add this to the software, but putting attention there created a lot of value. Another example is uh, misnotifications in Slack. So like a lot of other software, if you're not logged in and you get a message or notification, by default, we'll send you an email notification. But of course, a lot of people start using Slack to escape email, and so it was originally when you launched the mobile app and started getting push notifications, you would get duplicate notifications, right? You would get an email notification and you would get a push notification. And this is something that many different pieces of software do. And it's annoying, right? Because we don't like getting duplicated notifications. There's no reason we should be getting a Chrome notification and a app, desktop app notification and a email notification and a push notification. So we decided to really be smart about that. And so, uh, what we started doing was when you enable push notifications on the mobile app, we just automatically disabled email notifications. And we sent you a little email saying, hey, just so you know, you're not going to get emails anymore. You've got the app now. It's a better way to get notifications. And again, this is a tiny, tiny detail. It didn't take any time at all. But it's something where we were able to make visible the thought that we were putting into the product. A lot of design details are invisible. You never really get credit for them. No one's going to thank you. And you know, that's as it should be most of the time. But in this case, you know, it did make sense. We didn't want to you know, disable email notifications without telling anyone. And so again, this is something we got tons of positive feedback on. And it was a simple little detail that just made a big difference because it showed that we were caring about their experience and the details. The final one here is, I think, I don't know. You, guys, you folks can tell me. It's, it's uh, maybe the, the best known, but kind of the most counterintuitive. Billing is an area where you're going to have peaks? Really? People don't like paying for software. They don't like paying for anything. Um, and that was exactly why we thought creating peaks in the billing experience was such a huge opportunity, because no one expects it. Um, and the change we made here was that you know, most business software, you choose the number of seats that you want to pay for, 
And if you use more than you expected, you get charged overages. And if you use fewer than you expected, well, you're not getting a refund. So there's, again, this tension of trying to manage that you have the exact number of seats so you're not wasting money in your software contract. And so from the beginning, we decided, no, we don't want to create this stressful situation. We're just going to credit people actively if users on their instance of Slack aren't actively in use. And again, we get so much positive feedback on this because it's the right thing to do. I think it's, it's hard if you're a existing business that's built on a certain uh, revenue model and, and making this change could have a negative effect. But because we were able to start from scratch and decide we were going to do the right thing here, it's something where every time we send out one of these emails that people don't expect saying, hey, we just gave you back money because it was the right thing to do. That's a really meaningful product experience. We build so much passion out of these credit emails. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a detail I, I'm really proud of working on. I think it's really useful kind of thinking about your own products. So high level, build a product with peaks and valleys. You're not going to have everything be perfect. Big pieces of your software are going to be missing. That's just the nature of building software. But give people something to hope for, right, as they're going through the valley of trying to figure out the onboarding experience or you know, putting in their credit card for the billing. You know, when they're walking through those valleys, give them peaks that they can look forward to. Give them peaks that tell them why they're going through this trouble because it goes a long way towards making people passionate about your software. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is the idea that one metric is not enough. I'm sorry. It's disappointing. A lot of folks really like the one metric thing. I don't know if, if, if I'm, I'm uh, talking crazy talk here, but you know, at least in my circles, a lot of people say, all right, we're going to unify around one metric. We're all going to care about growth rate or retention or revenue or whatever it is, and the whole company is going to rally around that. And that's a seductive idea, but the problem is, is that making software is complicated. And it's seldom that one metric is going to capture the complexity of the product decisions that you're making at various points in, in the development cycle, right? That wherever you have one metric go up, it's likely that other metrics are going down or staying the same. And if you're not thinking about all those other metrics, or at least the possibility that maybe there's another metric that might matter, you're not really seeing the whole story. So I, to illustrate this, I wanted to talk about sort of my, my experience coming into Slack, because you know I wasn't there in the gaming days. I joined kind of just after the official launch, kind of in the spring of 2014. And you know I, I came in, and this was the growth chart that I was looking at. So I said, OK, that's really up and to the right in an extreme way. <laughs> that looks pretty good. I mean, it's, it's only you know, our quantitative metrics only you know, 15,000 daily actives, which is you know, good, but not huge in the grand scheme of things. And you know, the qualitative metrics we were looking at are our customer support, the feedback from Twitter. Um, that was looking great. Everyone was loving the software, telling us we were doing a great job. So everyone was feeling very, very happy. And I sat there saying, Huh, up and to the right, everyone loves us on Twitter. What am I here for again? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and it, it, was, it was a great opportunity to dig into this stuff a little bit deeper and understand what was really happening below the surface. And what I found was, you know, if you look at this chart, um, the preview release began kind of the previous August of, of 2013. So a lot of the people, you know, that, or the companies that represented this growth were friends and family. Like these were people in small teams, highly technical, largely in the Bay Area or in major cities in the US. Um, and we've been working with them on a very uh, quick iterative basis. So we were really fixing a lot of things specifically for their needs. And so it was great that we were growing that fast. But when I talked to everyone about what the future of the company was and what they were concerned about as far as sort of what I should be working on, they said big teams. They said, we're, you know, we're a company of 25 people right now. We're talking to a lot of other 25, 50, 100 person teams. How is Slack going to work for a 500 person team or a 5,000 person team or a 50,000 person team? And 
That sounded like a big challenge. And so thankfully I was able to dive into that and those were early days, but we had a few teams that had at least a few hundred people. I think Braintree had probably 500 people at that point. And they were one of the first customers that I visited. And those customer visits really opened my eyes. It was so powerful to kind of cut through all those, you know, up into the right quantitative metric, all the super positive qualitative metrics, and see this team that was passionate about Slack, otherwise they wouldn't have grown to 500 people, but they were running into some serious issues. There were some, some things that were really broken for teams of that size. And part of what was really exciting was that we were able to identify some quick fixes that within a few weeks were pushed out and were really making a big difference for those teams. And then we also had some bigger things to work on, right? There were more long-term improvements that we knew that, okay, some people will get along without these, but if we really wanna go for growth into big enterprises, we're gonna have to do these features eventually. And those went on the roadmap. And this was, I think this was a really important moment for us because we realized that big growth doesn't, doesn't come through doing the same thing over and over again, regardless of what stage you're in, right? We realized that, okay, we've done some things right. We've gotten our up into the right graph for 15,000 actives, but it didn't necessarily mean that we were gonna continue growing at that rate. And when you're on top, you wanna keep growing at that rate, and there was this pressure on us to start doing that. And, you know, I, I can say I'm, I'm proud here, I don't know if you can see this well, but, um, uh, yeah, there we go. So, you know, as we grew over time, fortunately for us, we, we focused on a lot of these things for not just those core users, but larger teams, teams in non-technical companies, big enterprises, all of these different areas that we knew we needed to improve in. And that got us to 500 million, or 500 million, 500,000 uh, actives by sort of a year after that launch when I started. And by you know, the middle of this year when I left, we were already at well over a million daily active users. And you know, if, if I can give any advice on how to do that, it's, it's to say to not rest on your laurels because it was very tempting for us to do that, getting all that positive feedback. But we had to go back to those metrics and really understand, okay, the chart's going up into the right, but what does that really mean? What's the story behind those numbers? And that's part of why I really think that one metric is not enough. You need to understand the full context behind why things are going well, why things are going poorly, and triangulating for multiple metrics is the way you do that. So I think one lesson to talk about here is, is that every product decision is a trade-off. So if you think about something like deciding to send another email to your user base, you've got a positive metric, some people are gonna click, but then you've got at least one negative metric, right, that some people are going to unsubscribe. And so let's say you get 50% click-through rate. That's amazing. Very few people get 50% click-through rates. But without the context of the unsubscribe rate, you don't really know what that means. If it's a 1% unsubscribe rate, maybe that's fine. If it's a 50% unsubscribe rate, every person who's clicking is clicking the unsubscribe link. That's not very good. So this is a simple example, but this, this is the reason that it can be dangerous to just be looking at one metric, because you can be creative about finding all these different ways to grow that one metric, but it might be the expense of these things you're not even thinking about, you're not even looking at, and that is a scary part. So for email, you know, this is all in one dashboard, right? You can probably look at those numbers side by side. What about strategic decisions? So let's say that we've decided to focus on existing customers. So we want to increase customer satisfaction. That's our positive metric we want to measure. But we're concerned that, well, okay, if we're not putting this emphasis on new markets, maybe that's going to limit our growth. And this gets even more complicated because what does limiting growth mean? Does it mean that we'd be okay with flat growth or only slightly increasing growth? Or do we understand that that's going to mean that we're going to have negative growth into in these new markets? And then how are we going to measure that? What's the time frame for that? Customer satisfaction, maybe that's a survey. How often are we doing that survey? Every six months? Every three months? How are we going to draw the connection between this focus on existing customers and the numbers in that customer satisfaction survey? Those are hard questions. And the fact that you the information on growth in the new markets, that's not going to be in that survey, right? That's probably going to be in your revenue dashboard. Is it going to be split up by market? Do you have that information there? Are you able to make 
that cut in your data? Maybe, maybe not. This is why it's important to think about the upside and the downside, to tell yourself that, okay, we're gonna have to measure these two different things and keep an eye on this because we're making this bet and we hope it's right, but not every bet is gonna be right. And if you're not watching both sides, it can really catch you off guard. And this example is exactly what happened at Slack because we were looking at customer support, we were looking at Twitter and we were saying, okay, everyone's complaining about this. Run, 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 let's fix this, we'll hang free to shoot. And that was great for right after launch when we were trying to polish this product that really was very raw and new. But there was a point at which we said, we have to stop. You know, we're spending too much time chasing these little issues that don't necessarily matter in the grand scheme of things. And that was, that was a real kind of turning point for the company because we were able to make a higher level prioritization of what's really important for us right now, even if it's something that means ignoring this metric, this piece of data, because we know that this metric is more important. We have risk in this area, and so we need to pay attention to working on that. So I think the lessons we can draw from that are, they're interesting, right? I think one thing that's really important is, okay, we don't wanna lose everything of the whole one metric idea, right? The power of one metric is that it unifies people. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do, what's gonna make the company successful. And the danger of the one metric is that, okay, let's say you're focusing on revenue. How are the people in customer support going to interpret this focus on revenue? Are they gonna be able to generate revenue? Probably they're not gonna be selling people from the customer support tickets. And so really the, the thing that I think is more useful for being relevant to every area of your company, every department, every individual, is just talking about goals instead. Because if you're talking about goals and sort of, you know, again, kind of these big ideas or, or sort of vision behind the company, you can have each department or each individual contextualize those goals. So you can still have a process where you explicitly focus on certain metrics, but it means that it doesn't have to be the same metric for everyone. Because it's very unlikely that every person in the company should be focusing on the same metric. It's unlikely that it's gonna be the same quarter to quarter to quarter. So understanding that you need to be flexible on metrics, but that you still do need vision and you want people united around a big idea of what the company is going to do, is a great way to sort of get some of the benefits of that one metric idea without getting too focused on one thing to the exclusion of all these other pieces of data, quantitative and qualitative. Um, I think kind of the, the simple you know, corollary to this is just pay attention to the upside and the downside. Right, that I think a lot of us get very excited about a new product initiative or change and we're only looking at you know, this great positive change it's going to make. But every one of these changes is a bet that you're making on the future. So we're not always gonna be right. And that's just the reality of a product, no matter how confident we feel about a given decision. And so you have to wonder what's going to happen if those bets don't work out. And it doesn't mean you have to measure everything. I'm not saying you know, you need to have 18 metrics measured for every tiny decision, but at least start by thinking about it, by understanding that there's always at least two sides to any of these decisions, and understand that maybe it's worth measuring, or at least you know, knowing to, that we're gonna have to pay attention to it at some point. So high level, every decision is a trade-off. Make sure that you're measuring both sides. <laughs> So, um, so that's kind of the, the high level for uh, big ideas for, for growth. Um, just to review, you've got big ideas, tell the big stories behind them. This is around leveraging PR, for, even from the early days, to speak to the big vision behind the company and to generate a bigger conversation about what your company is doing. Build a product with peaks and valleys. Understand that not everything is gonna be perfect from the get-go and then you need to focus on doing certain things really, really well, having these moments of joy in order to get people through these areas that maybe aren't as built out, or aren't as built out, or not there at all. And remember that every one of these decisions is a trade-off. So you're not always going to be sure you know, what all of the effects are. And so being aware of the different variables at play and not just focusing on one metric to the exclusion of all others um, is a really important idea for understanding how to balance your quantitative and your qualitative and all the different metrics affecting your business. I know this is only three ideas and there's a, 
there's a lot of other stuff I, I learned in Slack that I wanted to talk about, but I, I, I hope this was useful because these are some things that as I look back at what we did at Slack and what I learned and you know what I wanted to make sure that I remembered that I brought forward to my, my, next, uh, my next product experiences, um, they seemed really important. So um, thank you. Big thanks, Kevin. Uh, so what we're going to do here, uh, we do have the live stream going on, so uh, we're going to do some q and I'm going to kind of walk around with the mic, so if you just want to raise your hand, um, we'll start doing some questions. And um, while you're raising your hand, I'll ask the first one. So I, Kevin, you, uh, you had a great post on Medium that got a lot of attention um, around the topic here. And uh, in it, you kind of made a point around understanding your product's learning curve and kind of what happens along that learning curve for customers to get to value. And I was wondering if you could start kind of talking a little bit about that, because I thought that was a really uh, really good astute point to bring up. Well, I mean, this, this is one of those tricky things, because I think everyone understands that they don't want a learning curve for their product, right? You want it to be walk up and use. And so really it's about shortcuts, right? That there are probably things that you would like your customer to do to get the full value out of the software. But, you know, there's this idea of, of scaffolding in, in uh, education that I think is really useful, which is that you don't teach everything at once. You don't start with calculus with kindergartners, right? You get them started on ABCs and one, two, threes, and over time, you can develop people and sort of get the full value out of that knowledge. And I think it's the same thing in software, that fast forward to giving people value as quickly as possible, um, you know, and that, that was sort of what we aimed for with having Slack be a free product and one that was relatively straightforward for anyone to create a team, uh, to make it you know, easy to join a team, you know, within your company. You know, there are a number of things we did to just sort of fast forward to being able to chat, being able to have that basic communication with your coworkers. But I think there's, there's analogies for all sorts of different types of products. Uh, Kenneth, thank you very much. Uh, I have not seen in 30 minutes somebody systematically dismantle lead startup, MVP, OMTM, and other associated concepts. So thank you so much for that. And personally, uh, grateful to you for giving a talk to uh, a startup audience which is drinking the lean startup Kool-Aid, so thanks a lot. Uh, um, so given that, how do you maintain, my simple question is, uh, how do you maintain that philosophy even as the organization grows? Are there any organizational things that, you know, you as one of the key points were like you were 25 employees to 200 employees. How did you maintain that philosophy throughout? Was the employee uh, new, you know, new people you're finding? Like what are the kind of things that you had to train or do stuff? You know, I, I don't, I'm not going to claim, you know, Slack had any organizational innovations to, uh, um, you know, to sort of communicate culture. I think it's, it's one of those things where the best thing you can do is understand that these things are not well, that certain certain product development decisions are not just process, they are a culture. And I think that there's a little bit of a different communication associated with that, that process is always gonna change over time. And even the time I was at Slack, you know, we rebuilt our, our development process three different times. We had, you know, multiple different video conferencing and structures for how we structured our channels. So that's kind of just always going to be a work in progress, especially when you're growing fast or in early stage. Um, whereas I think at least if you think about what are the sort of tenets of your product development culture, at least that's something that can be communicated in more subtle ways, right? That that's just something that will happen in your first one-on-one -on -one with your manager, that will happen in feedback after team meetings or in product reviews. Um, if, you're, if you're explicit, and you know, I think one of the things Stuart, the CEO, did really well was talk a lot about you know, his product development philosophy and that sort of translated into, into the culture. And that was that was one thing that I think did sort of draw a kind of a connection line between the 25 person version of the company and the 200 person version. Again, thanks a lot, um, I really love the, the concept of the credit back for, for users that don't use the product. And I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit more on what that conversation looked like as you made that decision for that. Because so many uh, services, you know, they, they have these cutoffs that just are so abstract and uh, arbitrary. 
Well, I, I wasn't there for the original conversation, but I think you know when we discussed it, you know, subsequent times and sort of the pros and cons of it. I think one of the most important things that, that came out of that was that we had we had that conversation early and had a conversation that wasn't just about revenue maximization, but that was about what kind of a company do we want to be, and that kind of gets to the the culture thing, right? Because I think if we if we made that decision six months later, we would have had to change something, and so it would have been disruptive. And the fact that we did think about it as a cultural decision, and as you know, and that that meant that we were able to make it at a very early stage. Um, it sort of wasn't painful because that was just the way it was from the very beginning. Um, and you know, I, I say this only because I've talked to a lot of people at more mature enterprise companies that already have the more typical. Uh, perceived model, and they say, "How do we make the change? This would be a big deal for us." And I sort of have to say, "Well, you know, you have to decide, you know, what kind of a relationship you want to have with your customers." And you know, it's it's not it's not that it's you know 100% wrong to go with that model because obviously a lot of companies use it. Um, it's more that you know, it's I, I think it's I think it's a discussion around um, you know just what the pros and cons are, and I think you know a lot of what I'm kind of getting at with. The um, one metric is not enough. Is that often there's a quantitative metric like revenue that's very concrete, and then it's easy to jump to optimizing. But you're not looking at all these um, sort of qualitative metrics of every time someone goes, "Oh God, we've got you know we're underutilizing on our Slack instance, or you know we're overutilizing, and so you know we're getting all these penalty charges." Like how how much does that hurt the business collectively? And that's super hard to quantify. But at least thinking about it gets you to sort of start. So when you meet to customers like Braintree, um, walk us through what a what an interview looks like or the time you spent with them. Like how did you dig into how they were using that and how did you use that to inform the product? Well, I mean that always depends, right? I mean it's you know I was a, I was a user researcher full time for three years, so um, I, I have a lot of opinions on, on user research. But I hear Jared School was already here, so I agree with everything Jared says. He's a great guy. Um, but um, for those initial visits, I I think I was trying to come in really naive because we had a very senior team with a lot of strong opinions about how it should work. So I very much just came in and said. Tell me about what you use Slack for. What are the other tools that you use? So it was more trying to get a picture of just what their world looked like without sort of biasing them one way or the other as far as how they were supposed to use Slack. Um, and you know that was, I think that was instructive. You know, and in, in subsequent research, I got a little bit more targeted because I felt like we had a better baseline of the diversity of ways that people use Slack. But at that point, part of what was really important for us was to. Kind of send that message to the rest of the company to say, hey, I know you know your ten best friends are all using Slack, and so you feel like you know how people use Slack. Well, you know we're lucky that the company is growing fast, so the definition of people is also changing very quickly, um, and that was really the number one message that research got across. Right, that you know we did we weren't able to make all the improvements immediately because you got to prioritize, but it meant that people really knew. Wow. Okay, our user base is changing. We really need to. Think about what that means. So I was kind of keeping track of your timeline that you were describing. Um, it sounded like you were the first PM at around 25 or 20 employees, and then you were there until about 200. That's right. Uh, could you talk about kind of how large did the PM team grow while you were there, and you know what was the ratio between PM and engineering, and kind of how did that work? Because you know peaks and valleys. How, how did you guys manage the peaks and valleys in the investment? Well, as far as the peaks and valleys, again, I think that's more of a cultural thing. That it's early on, you know, I I had come from a much more traditional engineering group where we didn't put in little fun extras, right? And so from the very beginning, it was very clear to me that fun extras were a part of of building product at Slack. And I think it was only once I'd been there for six months or a year that I really understood that that's not just for fun because we're fun, quirky people. It's because that actually makes people feel really good. Um, as, as far as the organizational structure, I mean, I think we started out with two engineers and, you know, say half a designer or one designer per PM. But I, I don't think that was that was really more just because we were lucky to be able to hire some great PMs, and it was harder. You know, it's always hard to hire engineers, at least in the Bay Area. Um, 
So over, over time, we, we transitioned to more like a ratio of about, I think, five engineers per PM. But again, I, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that was done with extreme intention. It was more a matter of, you know, you're a fast growing company, so you know, we weren't able to hire engineers for a while. Then we were doing really well. We got a lot of press. We were able to hire engineers more quickly. And so it was a matter of how do we give those engineers something useful to work on. Um, so yeah, I, I you know I, I think I tend to agree with kind of the you know Amazon two pizza rule that you know if you're a team that can't be fed by two pizzas, it's a little bit hard to get everyone aligned. But um, part of part of I think what was useful about you know how we organized at Slack was just that we were able to have a lot of design resources. So it meant that um, I was able to work ahead with the designer on getting a, you know there's still five different features I fully spec'd out and worked with the designer on that haven't shipped yet because we were able to work that far ahead and sort of work in um, sort of in parallel you know, with the engineers on things that were actually in development and sort of iterating on the version in production. So um, it gave us a little bit more opportunity for parallelism. Uh, hey, thank you very much for the, the great talk. Um, in particular, I liked the, the peak and valley um, point you made. Um, I was hoping you could give a bit more advice or recommendation on selecting those peak areas on kind of more generally if you were to approach a new product, how would you select which ones to really optimize for? Um, the read of the examples you gave, it seems to be those that might have an emotional charge, right? Either you know somebody nervous about doing something or someone like delighted to get money back. But if you could more generally give advice on um, where to pick those peak areas. Sure. Um, so I, I think there's kind of two different types there. I mean, really, when I talk about peaks, I'm I'm not talking about the sort of broad areas of product emphasis because I you know I think everyone sort of knows you need to focus on being good at a few things. Um, I think the more subtle point is that one around um, the examples that I gave, which are really small, um, and so we didn't think about those as okay. Here we need to add a you know a emotional high point. Right, it's sort of sort of hard to do that. It was much more opportunistic, um, where we we all knew that it was okay to add these things, and so some of them went in, some of them didn't. Um, but there was just a general permission that you don't have to just implement what exactly what's on the spec, or just do the absolute minimum that could you know sort of uh, you know do do what needs to be done in the software. It was well, we can come up with some ideas. You know, maybe some of them will make it into the product, some of them won't, but let's at least have the discussion around, can we go a little bit further there? Now, as far as the bigger sort of goals, you know, the sort of top three emphases for the product, that's a totally different conversation. Kenneth, we've got to be very productive as product people. I'm the voice of nowhere. Yeah, I'm like, where are you? I'm right here in front of you. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Um, whether it's Slack or Prior, or any of the other projects, um, the product is a product of you if you're managing and leading things. So are there any routines, virtues, or um, philosophies that you use as a product leader that you felt led to your success? Whoa, savvy one. Um, gosh, I mean, I think the thing that's, that's most important to me in terms of my product development philosophy is um, kind of that, that background in design and research, right? That when, when I start a new project or I join a new team or I join a new company, I always start with you know, kind of that question of who are we serving? What are these people, what are their lives like? What are the challenges they're facing? And that was, that was kind of my main goal going into that research. I, I didn't expect that we would have such a strong um, you know, result in terms of the needs of, of large teams at that point. Um, but I think starting from that perspective just is a good way to really ground yourself and it's a good way to add value at a very early stage because often, especially mature teams or teams that have been working together for a long time, um, they'll, they'll have a sense of, okay, we know what's going on. You know, we know our users, we know our customers. And you know, part of that sort of ironic um, sort of result of success is that you do know them at a certain point and then you're so successful you don't know them anymore. And so it sort of reminds the team that you need to be refocusing on what are the needs of the moment and sort of who are your customers right now. 
And I, I got a great lesson on that actually early in my career because my first product manager gig was actually working on Dreamweaver um, back in the day. And that was, um, that was interesting because you know, Dreamweaver was this um, you know, desktop web development tool, which was a big deal in you know, .com 1.0. But by the time I started working on it, it was kind of a little bit passe. Like professionals would not build websites with it. And I think that's you know, even more so the case today. And so I think the team had a little bit of a sense of, oh, we serve web development professionals. And when we went out and actually visited the customers, it was much more, well, you know, there's an admin who needs to update the website for this nonprofit. And it was much more a tool for kind of these in-between people who had responsibility for you know, a site, but weren't necessarily kind of this perfect vision of this hyper-professional web designer or web developer that you know, might have hoped for. I think that's a lesson that probably all of us can afford to learn that you know, we have our persona of who we want to be serving, but probably the reality of people is that it's a little bit messier and kind of getting into that mess and figuring out where you can be helpful is a great way to build a product. <clears throat> You had a question about early on. You talked about using the press well uh, up front. Um, just understanding what your product is and, and how it uh, evolved in that area. Did you, can you talk about kind of a mix of uh, PR versus AR analyst relations or influencer relations, which has gotten you know, a lot more emphasis in the last few years? I would think of the difference between those things is more about kind of channels and sort of what are the best ways to reach the people that you want to reach. Um, I think, you know, really what I was talking about is just, it's just good storytelling, right? Of, you know, understanding that you're not there to report that you raised funding like 700 other seed stage startups. It's to say, we have a big idea about how the world is going to be. And whether you're telling that to TechCrunch or to a trade publication or to an analyst or to a set of influencers, probably has more to do with your product category and your kind of specific go-to-market. But everyone is going to be more impressed and more likely to tell a story that's just compelling and interesting and speaks to a hopeful and interesting future. Hey, thanks so much for coming. Uh, you, you spoke about the importance of setting goals, and I think that's something that surely resonates with any leader or aspirational leader. Curious to know, how often did your goals change at Slack, and how do you rationalize setting new goals? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I guess they, I mean, they change pretty frequently, but I think not in a way that was disruptive, just in a, in a way that things actually changed a lot. And so it was natural that our priorities needed to change. Um, you know, so I think the, you know, the, the quick timeline was we did a big launch, we got a lot of attention, more attention than we expected, and so we had to scramble, scramble, scramble to fix, fix a bunch of um, you know, very critical bugs and you know, very frequent requests that were kind of low-hanging fruit. And there was this very explicit um, kind of sort of transition point where we realized, okay, this was great when we were 20 people and we were all super senior, and we could just jump on, you know, prioritizing and knowing that this little thing was going to be the right project to work on for the next two days. And then our productivity just kind of ground to a halt because everyone was working on their own pet project. And that was just kind of a sign that we needed to step up a level and have a more professional product prioritization. So I think a little bit of it is just paying attention to the business and not just getting stuck in operational stuff but being able to look at that high level and say, okay, we were productive and now we're kind of not so productive. So that probably has an implication about what process should look like. And honestly, I think the, the goal was really came out of those process changes when I thought about it. I mean, it's really that once we identified that there was a problem, we could dig into it, figure out what was going to happen. And there was kind of a shared, uh, you know, shared buy-in that okay, we all understand this is the thing that's going to happen, so of course we need to reprioritize and work on this thing first. All right, great, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions, so please raise your hand if you have one. I'll head right back there. There was one online, Kenneth, um, let me answer that one first as I walk to the back, um, uh, around kind of competitive tools, so especially as you moved into like bigger enterprises, they already had you know, lots of messaging apps and other kind of tools for communication. How much time did the team kind of spend evaluating those and kind of doing competitive baseline and benchmarking as they kind of 
build your roadmap? We, we didn't really spend almost any time on that. I mean, actually our approach there was a, a very a very slack approach, which is we had um, a, a couple channels set up with different types of competition, and so we would just feed all of their Twitter feeds and all of their um, all the their Twitter mentions, so we could sort of see an ongoing feed of just what the chatter was about the competitors. But so it was it was more like that gave us visibility into major product launches or changes in direction. But ultimately, I think we were pretty clear that you know we were we were basically all growing a new product category, which is enterprise messaging, um, and so we we were really con concerned about trying to push out someone else because that wasn't the typical situation. I mean, the typical situation was the team didn't have a messaging solution or it had five different bottoms up kind of competing messaging solutions, but there very seldom was you know a whole company group messaging solution that we were looking to displace. So honestly, I think we understood that all of our burdens was more to speak to the value of the category rather than why Slack is better than X competitor. Great. Okay, again, we're going to do a couple of questions. So raise your hand and then uh, stick around afterwards. We do have a couple of door prizes to give away. So, um, uh, thank you. And um, I had a question about um, when looking for talent or making hiring decisions, how did you evaluate cultural fit? How did you make those decisions? Oof. Man, those are tough questions. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we we landed on on a process that was perfect for that. I mean, I think that the the best thing we did was really talk about culture in a very explicit way in all hands and in my team meetings. You know, I talk about it with the early engineers and you know how aggressive we were in terms of you know when we were shipping or how early we were shipping. Um, so it's. I think it's I think it's honestly I mean probably people who are experts in interviewing will have better ideas about how to make that evaluation. For us, the thing that made the most difference was just having a conversation about what our culture was on a regular basis, just so it was it was on people's lips. It wasn't an unspoken thing or something where we felt like we couldn't really talk about it. It was something where we all felt like we had this higher you know higher aspiration that we were trying to uh, trying to uh, trying to reach ourselves. And so we kind of had to bring a little bit of that perspective into interviews as well, because we were also trying to be the best version of you know, ourselves and our own teams. Yes, I was really impressed um, because this is going to transparency, and apparently you're quite a fan of that. Sure am. Um, that was a very courageous observation that you made, and then commitment to getting an answer to what am I doing here when they brought you on board and you saw what their growth looked like, like behind the scenes as well as obviously. Um, what question did you ask of yourself when you decided you would go? Because you went kind of early in a way for a company like this in the position that you had, it seems to me. No, that's a fair question. And actually, my, my joke is if, if the the first question that everyone asks me is, what's the secret sauce? How did you folks do it? The second question they ask is, what, are you crazy? Why would you leave? No, I don't think you're crazy. I think you're brilliant. But I want to know about what. <laughs> um, for me, it was, it was just about um, kind of what, you know, what I was interested in working on. And I think part of why Slack is a great company is because it has a really great product focus leader. And that's you know, Stuart Butterfield, the CEO. Um, and so for me, it was something where I was able to add a lot of value and learn a lot in that first uh, first year and some. Um, but ultimately, I felt like I wanted to you know have a little bit more control, and you know that wasn't something that made sense in the context of Stuart being you know the product guy. So I feel feel like I'm I'm doing doing even better being out here and hopefully helping some of you folks and you know continuing to learn. Okay. You, you spoke about metrics for the company. Did you have any metrics for your PMs? You know, we we started we started working on on metrics for the PMs, and I think this is something that was especially tricky for us because you know some businesses are more quantitatively focused, and of course quantitative metrics are easier to measure. 
And I think because Slack is so focused on kind of experience and design and um, these things that are a little bit trickier to measure, um, we, we, we had trouble sort of nailing that down. So I think the best thing that we found was really just focusing on schedule because that was something that you know, we could really see the trade-offs. Um, it was something where we knew that we weren't executing as quickly as we could. Um, and so measuring ourselves just on whether we were able to hit a date or not was a great way to sort of check ourselves and say, all right, you can use whatever process you want uh, in terms of getting to the right design and iterating, iterating, iterating at the design stage, at the development stage. But it also forced us to ask hard questions about, well, is it better to iterate at the design stage or at the development stage? You know, how much, you know, at what point is the iteration just churning and not making progress versus something that's actually productive? And, um, you know, that I think focusing on dates as a sort of very specific metric to say, did you hit that? Did you not hit that? Was a great way to generate that conversation and at least sort of get to some of that accountability and process improvement. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you. So we do have a couple of door prizes to give away, as uh, Joshua mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago. And But first, um, wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, Product Austin on Twitter. Please uh, feel free to follow Product Austin on Twitter. And um, look forward to our October speaker, who's going to be Landon Napier, the founder of Build Group. And he took Rackspace to, from, uh, from startup to 1 billion IPO. Uh, and so he's our October speaker. And you can go to productaustin.com and uh, sign up using the Eventbrite widget there. So I urge you to do that. Also, uh, we have an attendee survey. Uh, those of you who have come before know that uh, we like to poll the audience on uh, what we can do better and what you liked uh, and what you didn't. So that link you can do right now. It's uh, bit.ly slash slack slack. That's bit.ly slash slack slack. So please take out your devices and, uh, and visit that link and complete the survey. And give you a couple minutes to do that. slash slack slack all lowercase Uh, feel free to continue filling out that survey while I mention uh, one more party note before we get to the, or two more party notes before we get to the door prizes. Uh, parking validation uh, is available from the front desk. And uh, we should uh, thank again our sponsor who made all of this happen and who frequently makes it happen with bringing great speakers in. And that's uh, Pabacher's uh, uh, CraftsmanPM.com. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Provocator puts on um, Craftsman PM workshops uh, on a pretty frequent basis, and he just happens to have one coming up here in Austin very soon, just around the corner, just in the next couple of days, September 10th through 11th, and I believe there are some slots still open to uh, sign up for that. So you can go to craftsmanpm.com to do that. 
Uh, so now the two door prizes. So Kenneth is going to be giving away one of them. And while he's considering who the best, who asked the best question, which seemed like there were a lot of really good ones, a lot of really tough ones uh, that Ken somehow managed to handle really well. Um, but before we get to that one, I, w I did want to, uh, hopefully, Sabari, is there a, a gentleman named Sabari here? Uh, best tweeter, the most prolific, with very good uh, verbiage, very descriptive, very well, uh, very well spoken on, on Twitter. So you're going to get uh, one of the Kindle books uh, that, that uh, Propaker is going to supply you with uh, if you email him. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, a little card here. So great job. I, I know you did it, uh, I believe you did it last month as well. It was really good thing too, but you left before I could give you the prize last year, so it just something else. Yeah, I'm, uh, it's hard to decide. There really were a lot of great questions. Thank you for uh, keeping me thinking up here. Um, all right, I, how, how about um, the gentleman in the red and blue plaid shirt? Excellent question, thank you. All right, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Don't forget uh, next month's October meeting um, and signing up at productaustin.com. Thanks. And of course, thanks. Thank you. And, uh, I'm happy to hang around if anyone else has uh, other questions or wants to chat.